All right, video people, welcome. Today, tonight, this evening, whenever you're listening to this, we are going to talk about William Blake. Wild, weird William Blake. He actually wasn't wild. I don't know why I said that. Um, okay, so this is him. This is what he looks like. This is William Blake. And his story, the theme of William Blake, is that he was a man who had two lives that he lived. He lived one life to the public, and he lived one life inside of his own mind, and his lives were very, very different. The life that he lived in the public was not extraordinary. In fact, like now, if you taught any course on British literature or poetry, you would always study William Blake. He's one of the most important, well-known poets. He's um, considered by many to be the founder of the Romantic age of poetry. He's just hugely influential, and people would say, oh, you have to study him. But in his day, he wasn't really known. And I think that's because, like I said, the life that he lived outwardly was not extraordinary. So we'll just kind of talk about some things that he did, who he was, and then I'll tell you about his inside life. So we'll start with his outside life, how he appeared to others, the things he did, places he went. Uh, he spent a lot of his youth, he had a like a fairly wealthy family, and he got to spend a lot of his youth in the English countryside, which, look at these pictures. I don't even think this is real. It's so pretty. So he's like a little boy. I mean, can you imagine a better place to play if you were a little kid? Oh, you guys are city kids. You had to play in the street, probably, but not William Blake. He got to go to the countryside and just frolic in the trees and with sheep maybe I don't know whatever this is where he spent his youth he um, was very artistic though and he was an artist he could draw I like this picture I don't know when he drew it it's a picture of Isaac Newton um, here's another picture that he drew so you can kind of see by this picture maybe a little bit of that inside life I was telling you about um, but he was very good at drawing. He started uh, drawing school when he was 10. His parents didn't formally educate him in school. I think they were of the belief that like formal education kind of robs children of something essential, their freedom or um, cre creativity. So his parents never put him into like a formal school. But when he was 10, he went to uh, drawing school. And then later he went to the Royal Academy of Art. When he was 14, he became an, an apprentice to an engraver. Um, engravings, that was like a fairly common job back then. They, you could engrave pictures or words onto a variety of surfaces. You know, they didn't have machines to do this. So if you needed something uh, engraved or etched, you had to have a professional do it. So it wasn't like, I guess it was like a fairly artistic job, but uh, people were artisans back then. It wasn't weird or anything to become... Uh, an engraver, an artist. He then later married, see, pretty like normal. He goes to school, he gets a like steady job, he marries this woman named Catherine. This is kind of sweet. Uh, you might appreciate this. I don't think of him as like a really sweet person. I don't think of him as a mean person or like, I don't know, bad in any way. I just don't think of him as sweet. But he uh, married his wife, Catherine, and she was illiterate when they married. But he taught her to read, and then she later helped him with his engravings. He stayed married for a long time. They didn't have any kids. Uh, so he became moderately... He turned into Nirvana. No, I'm just kidding. He became uh, moderately successful. Like He could make a living with his engraving and his um, doing illustrations. But then the need for his work kind of dried up. I don't know why. They were just over it. They wanted, I don't know, different different people to engrave and illustrate. Uh, so th I wish that I knew more about this story. I could only find like little bits and pieces of it. But he's, I don't know how old he is at this time, maybe in his 20s still. He moves in with this wealthy guy who was well known in the art scene. And I think the guy tried to make uh, William Blake sell out, like make more conventional art, um, and then make a profit off of him, but he didn't want to be a sellout. 
you don't know why I'm showing Nirvana on the cover of Rolling Stone right now, look it up. I'm not saying that it will be a bonus question. I'm not saying that it won't be now. I just thought of that right now in my head. Um, so he didn't, he didn't want to sell out, so he left. Um, he started publishing poetry when he was 26. He created his own technique of etching, which I actually thought that this was kind of interesting, so I'm just going to very briefly tell you what he did. Um, he would use uh, copper plates. Like, normally you etched into the surface of whatever it was you were etching on um, the material, uh, but he used copper plates and he wrote with uh, m a substance that was resistant to acid and then he would just pour the acid over the plate so it would um, it would make the writing appear raised then because it would eat away the rest of the plate. That makes sense, right? Like this, like the picture shows. Uh, so he invented that. Um, like I said, he was largely unrecognized in his lifetime. That's what we need to know about him. If you want to know what, how he died and the rest of his life that's not really relevant to the poetry, read your book. Alright? Read your book. It's not what I'm here for. We're only, getting, we're only talking about the stuff that's relevant to the stuff you're going to read. Alright, so now let's talk about the mind of William Blake. Outside, like we said, goes to school, it's a steady job, he's like obviously a little quirky, you know, he's not gonna sell out, he wants to make his weird art, whatever, but not, not like super strange guy. Inside though, that was a different story. The man and the mind were very, very different. So I told you that he spent his youth in the countryside, uh, for looking around. What I didn't tell you is that he believed he could communicate with God, and I don't mean like through prayer, I mean physically communicate with God while he was in nature. He would see spirits and he would talk to them. I think his first vision, uh, which scared him, reportedly screamed when this happened, but he was four and he saw God put his uh, God's head up against a window. Um, so when he was out in nature, he thought that he could communicate with a variety of spiritual heavenly entities. Like, really, truly, like, communicate with them. Uh, this was the first painting he ever did. It illustrates the death of Earl Godwin. Not like a dude's name was Earl, like he was an Earl. Uh, I think, like, he lived in the 11th century. Truthfully, I tried to find more out about this guy, but it was it was boring to me. Um, he was, like, an earl, and he died at a banquet. You can Wikipedia him if you want to know more about him. My point was just, like, it's kind of a disturbing scene to depict in your first drawing. It's not, like, I don't know, fruit on a table or something like that. Uh, I also told you about his, I guess we'll go back, uh, I also told you that he um, worked with an apprentice, uh, he was an apprentice, sorry, he was an apprentice and he worked with an engraver. What I didn't tell you was that he went to meet another dude who was supposed to be his mentor and he kind of freaked out a little bit when he met him because he thought, this guy's going to get hanged, wouldn't you know it, years later that dude gets hanged. Crazy story. Um, so then he worked with another engraver. So you've got a guy whose um, mind is interesting already. He's painting pictures of death from an early age. He's talking to spirits in nature. And when he works as the apprentice to this engraver, he spends a lot of time in gothic churches in England and you can imagine I mean just by himself hours and hours by himself doing engravings in these old gothic churches and you can kind of imagine I think I'll go back to the other ones you can kind of imagine someone who's I'm not going to say that his mind was fragile I don't know uh, maybe his mind was very sturdy but it was definitely he was prone to 
and maybe they weren't hallucinations. Maybe he was really prone to talking to spirits. But I'm just saying someone with that mindset being put, uh, you know, for hours and hours and hours in Gothic churches um, where he would engrave uh, suits of armor, funeral effigies, effigies just like a sculpture of a person like this. So that's that was his job, working in these churches. Just think about that. This is his mindset. He doesn't appear weird or anything, but his mind is what it is. And he's spending all of his time uh, with, you know, funeral effigies, uh, suits of armor. He worked in Westminster Abbey, which is a very, very old Gothic church in London. And he believed that there he saw visions. He thought that he heard, well, he claims to have heard chanting. Uh, he th believes that he talked to Christ, apostles, monks, priests. So this was very different side of him that people didn't see. And I don't know if he, like, enjoyed that time. It makes me feel bad for him, though. Um, just hearing voices and seeing spirits and spending all day in these sort of, like, dark gothic churches. Uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of information about his poetry. We'll go over the individual poems themselves in class. Um, but so the, the life that he led both um, outwardly and inwardly definitely affected his poetry and I think you'll be able to see some of the ideas that we talked about in relation to his life in play when you read his poems. But I'm going to talk to you about some of the themes of his poetry. He was a very spiritual person. Um, he believed that God, spirituality, formed the foundation of most of his work. Um, he thought that he was instructed by archangels? Archangel? Archangels? We'll go with archangels to um, create his work. But even though I said he... And, and he said that God and spirituality formed the basis of most of his work... You have to know what that meant to him, because this is what you're going to see a lot in the poems that he wrote. To him, God was not maybe a Christian God like you would think of God now. Um, he viewed God as a more abstract, let's say that. Uh, he thought that God was really an energy that connected us all, and the unity between people was a really big theme in his poems. He also believed that um, we were all God, that humans were divine, uh, that there really wasn't a separation between a God-like entity and people, that we all were sacred and divine ourselves. Uh, he also differed a lot, and you'll see this um, in his views about um, the physical body and soul. And he reminds me of the song, Take Me to Church. I was actually listening to this on the radio, and I thought, William Blake. I don't know if I'm embarrassed that I did that or if I'm proud that I did that. But um, anyhow, I'll post a link to the song and an interview where Hosier, Hosier, I don't know what the guy's name is, where he talks about the song. Um, and you'll get to see why it was like William Blake. But William Blake believed that there was no division between body and soul that the body was holy, that the body was filled with spirit and the body was holy too. And so he was really open um, sexually. I don't know if he himself was having multiple partners. I don't know what was going on in his personal life, but I know that his views about sexuality um, were very open. So at the time, this was 18th century in England, he believed that there should be no restrictions on adultery, homosexuality, prostitution. To him, um, he using the body in whatever way was a spiritual act. Um, so acts involving the body were not considered like evil or sinful. They were considered the opposite, which was a spiritual, sacred, a communion with God, let's say. Um, he, so he was really critical of any sort of religion, like the Church of England, let's say, that encouraged people to suppress their natural desires. That's not the kind of God and church that he was into. Anything else about that? Uh, 
Also, I wanted to tell you before we look at the, don't look at this quote right now. Don't look at this Tumblr quote right now. Um, I also just wanted to say the last thing that I talked about was the relief etching, which was, just if you forgot, was this thing right here where he poured the acid over the um, acid-resistant substance. That This came about actually because he wanted to make his own art after he didn't want to sell out to that guy. He wanted to make his own art, but he didn't have a lot of money, and he wanted to produce things quickly. Um, oh, also I should tell you that a lot of his, he illustrated his poetry, which the illustrations aren't in our book, um, but they are a really big part of his poems, and they are actually meant to be read together. Like, you're supposed to be able to see the illustrations and the poems together. Um, but you can't, but I'm telling you that because it's important. Don't blame the people at Norton who made your book. They did the best they could. Um... But so that was the, yeah, he wanted to make his art with his poetry and he didn't have a lot of money and he needed to get um, a lot of these copies of his poems made. Uh, so he came up with relief etching. It's because normally if you didn't really do this form of etching, you had to etch the actual words into the material and then, um, you know, that was like, that was the process. So you would use the acid to etch the words. He used an acid resistant substance to write the words and then poured acid over the rest of the copper plate that he um, wrote and illustrated on. And this idea came to him from his brother who had passed after he passed. He thought that the dead were more with us than the living were because his soul was a true, the true part of a person. Um, but while you were on earth, you felt like there was not a division between the body and the soul. I don't know if that was a contradiction, perhaps. Still interesting, though. Um, all right, so... Sorry, sorry, sorry. It's crazy, people that are listening to the audio. Crazy things are happening right now. We'll be okay, though. All right, so the question that kind of, when you say William Blake, the question that kind of comes up is, was he crazy? Did he have some form of mental illness? that was undiagnosed and untreated. Um, and I don't know. You know, I like this quote. I like this Tumblr quote right here. Maybe I'll put it on my Tumblr. If you're listening to the audio, it's a quote by Ray Bradbury. It says, um, insanity is relative. It depends on who has who locked in what cage. So if he was, you know, if that was his life and he was talking to spirits and I can't talk to spirits, then you know, to his, it, from his perspective, I'm the crazy person. So I don't really know if he was crazy, if he had mental illness, or if he could communicate with the dead and with the, I don't know, sacred. Perhaps that's true. Uh, but I know this is a good, another Tumblr quote right here. Art should disturb the comfortable and comfort the disturbed. So I think that he got a lot of relief from his art. I can't imagine him having another sort of occupation. I think that um, in a way like some musicians, I think of this way, like you just have to make music or you have to dance or whatever it is you have to do. Um, I think he was the same way with creating uh, poetry and art. Um, and I think that it helped him in a way and I think that it, you know, was an outlet for whatever was happening in his mind. And so I think that if you, um, I don't know if you can hear a sound in the background. It's my cat, though, and it was like I was trying to make a poignant statement here, and that happened. So, okay, back it up a little bit. Um, so art helped him. It helped him calm his mind. I think it helped him release what he had going on inside of him, whether or not he was suffering from a mental illness. Um, and so if you read it and it makes you feel uncomfortable, I think that's good. Good. Try to feel a little bit uncomfortable when you read his poems. I'm not saying they're the work of a madman, um, because like I said, I might be, he might have been normal, and I might be crazy, who knows. Uh, but try to find a little bit of, uh, discomfort in some of the things he says. Why not? All right, so we will, like I said, talk about his poems 
in class and we'll be reading so make sure you have your book be ready for a quiz on the life of William Blake and I will see you in class all right goodbye